Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you're enjoying things. Uh, let's plunge right in and look at a topic that is not super numerical, but maybe slightly challenging. So let's take a peek at the setup. First of all, the setup is this, that up till this point, we have been looking at three different typologies of beams. In my mind, the simplest is the first one, which is a true cantilever beam. A cantilever beam means that it is fixed at one end and it is free at the other end. And we've been playfully using the image of a diving board because it's in our mind. But engineers don't really design a lot of diving boards. Yet we do design other cantilevers all the time. And those are skyscrapers, tall buildings, all tall buildings are cantilevers. Even if you had two uh, tall buildings that are connected to a bridge with a bridge, the free end is still out there by the clouds. There's nothing supporting the tip of the skyscraper. So all skyscrapers are cantilevers. So I like it. And yet there are some subtleties. There are some subtleties about the slope the slope at the con at the base at the fixed end does not change during the deformation of the structure that's a little hard maybe to understand because everything seems like it's bending on a diving board but right at the springing point where it leaps from the support if it was horizontal when it started it is horizontal at the end and if it's a cantilever skyscraper and it's vertical when it starts, it's vertical when the load hits the building. That's a little tricky. We'll get into that perhaps later. The second typology is in the middle of your screen here, and we call that a simply supported beam. It's something readily uh, in your image of perhaps crossing a river. Uh, with a stick or a log and you put one end of the log on one bank and you toss the other end over to the other bank and you hopefully walk across the log as a point load. The outer banks are your support conditions and they feel external. We don't have to get into internal or external. Um, we could parse that out a little bit more. We did a lot of that last time, but let's just call them support reactions right now. And they are unknown. That's the key idea. Let's just say they're unknown reactions. That is a popular image. And you may say, well, wait a minute. Uh, you don't design diving boards. Are you telling me you design logs that cross a river? And the answer is yes, we do. <clears throat> We design beams in buildings all the time, and those beams are supported very often simply. Now, what does that mean? That means that there is no moment transferred from the beam to the supporting element. There is force transferred for sure, but there's no way that that support, that mud on the riverbank can restrain the log from rotating. It doesn't happen. There is no moment transfer in a simply supported connection. That's a super important idea. I'm gonna say it again. There is no moment transferred to the supporting element in a simply supported or so-called pinned connection. And then finally, there's a little cantilever. Sometimes we call it an overhang to not confuse students <clears throat> because it's not exactly the same as the classic cantilever. Why not? Um, the classic cantilever, that big idea there is that that slope remains what it started out at. And here we might have a wildly different condition at the end of the problem. So here I might have a non-zero slope. There is a moment in that overhanging portion above the right support. There is a restraining moment, but it's not an infinitely stiff wall. 
It's the rest of the beam that is restraining the rotation. Think about this if there was no such moment there. If there was no such moment and we just had a support here and a support here and a hinge, everybody would be dead if who walked on that overhang. It would just flop over. So there is a moment in there. There is a moment in there. <clears throat> okay. So just as there are different typologies of beams, there are different typologies of forces. And we've studied two of them. The first is a concentrated force. Sometimes it's called a point force or a point load. It's applied to a single point. Then we have uniformly distributed loads, which are expressed as force per length. Now you could think of this as a bunch of point loads, maybe students standing very close to each other in a line and each student weighs student weight and the width of the student is student width. So you could say student weight per student width is my load. Um, in the United States, we use pounds per foot. In metric systems, we could use kilonewtons per meter, a force per length. Uh, it could start somewhere, it could stop somewhere. For instance, if it was students standing in a line, the line could end somewhere. Um, and that's the starting point and the stopping point of that external force. So just as a force, as a concentrated point load can become a uniform load when it is closely packed together, if you take these uniform loads and extrude them in and out of the page, they become force per area or force per length squared. And you could think of that as a floor. So the floor experiences a smeared out load per area. In the United States, that would be force per foot squared, pounds per foot squared. In, in Europe and, and everywhere else in the world, kilonewtons per meter squared. We'll get to that later because it requires three-dimensional thinking and we have plenty to do in two-dimensional thinking still. So let's hold off on force per area and let's look at concentrated forces and force per length. Now, just as there are different types of beams and just as there are different types of loads, there are different types of support conditions and we use icons for them, just like we use the arrows for the load or notice the, the horizontal line above the arrows for uniform load. That's an icon that we use that communicates an idea. The universally accepted icon for a pinned support is a triangle. And what that means, it's like uh, an anchor that has an axle perhaps, and you could rotate in one degree or maybe the center of your uh, analog clock where the arm of the clock rotates, but here it's pinned. And we use the triangle for that pinned connection. I like that one, it's nice. The circle is for a roller connection. And I don't like that one too much, but it's universally accepted. My difficulty with it is that students often think of this as a skateboard. And as the fun of a skateboard is in the aerial tricks that you can do leaving the ground. This wheel can never leave the ground. Perhaps a better image is to think of it as a slot. It's, a, it's moving in a slot. It can only roll along that slot. It cannot go up or down, but it is free to slide along that slot. That is what you learned in physics, hopefully as a frictionless surface a frictionless surface, which are super expensive. You go to the hardware store, they're gonna charge you a lot for those frictionless surfaces. They're in aisle 17. So why do we need three supports? Well, in two dimensional situations, like the ones that we are looking at, there can only be three unknowns. We can unambiguously establish the three unknowns. If there's a fourth unknown, we cannot unambiguously establish it. We need to know something about the beam itself, the material of the beam, the stiffness of the beam. 
But here we don't need any of that. We can just unambiguously say independent of any material, we know what the support conditions are. And there's only three unknowns in two dimensional space. So for instance, if you put another pin down, that's indeterminate. You cannot determine it using these techniques. If there are only three, then it is determinate. You can determine the reactions. If there's only two, everybody's dead. It's unstable, everybody's dead. Okay, here is a typical study that we do as engineers, all the way up through you know super famous people doing really important things to you as maybe a trained uh, person or maybe a completely non-technical person looking at this. This is a, a, a very common situation. Here's a beam. We have only three unknowns to force this determinate situation to apply. And we have some loads and the loads are known. That's a premise. The loads are known. We know the magnitude of the load and we know the position of the load and the direction, of course. <clears throat> so let's find the left supporting a reaction for the muller breslau method. Now there's nothing special about left. There's nothing special about putting the pin on the left side and the roller on the right side. You could flip them around and say the roller is on the left and the pin is on the right. Nothing special there. But let's get into the subtleties. Now the subtleties are this, when we are solving things by hand, I want you to use the classic muller breslau method the one that Heinrich Mueller Breslau developed. That means that the elements stretch and we will use similar triangles. That's the key to solving these situations, similar triangles. I will remind you of what similar triangles are in case you've forgotten. If you've never seen them, that makes me sad and makes me worried about the future of the education of our people. However, I will help you. When we are using the classic muller breslau method and we're looking at rotations, we will use 45 degrees. That is not one radian, that is not one degree, that is simply one. Heinrich talked to you about this last time, right? And he said, it is one. You're dividing by one. And that is in the classic method. In the modern method, we will make them very, very small and perturb them. But in the hand drawings, we will use the classic method, which means things stretch, okay? So that's hard, it's in the rules. Um, let's talk about similar triangles and talk about things stretching here. So in the modern Mueller-Breslau method, this stick, which was 18 units of length, would simply rotate. In the classic Mueller-Breslau method, that stick is longer and it gets long. It stretches out such that this point is above that point. That's super important in the classic method. And now we can use similar triangles. You could see it right there. And similar triangles are as follows, this over that in a triangle is equal to this over that. It's that simple. Those two are similar. They're not exactly the same, but you could tell there's something similar about them. That's why it's called similar triangles. And the rule is, let's call it H1, um, R1, H1 and R1, and this is H2 and R2, the height of one over the run of one is equal to the height of two over the run of two. So in our situation, delta over 18, is equal to loft one. And I'm pretending that everything stretches here. This is going to be loft one in the classic method, straight up from F1. That's loft one. So delta divided by 18 is equal to loft one 
divided by 13. And that's it. That's as hard as it gets. Similar triangles. Drop questions down <clears throat> in the discussion board or send questions to me if that is baffling. But that is as hard as it gets here. It's not algebra. It's similar triangles. <clears throat> uh, looking at loft two, we shoot this straight up. And we say delta over 18 is equal to loft 2 over 6. That's our equation here. OK? So that's really it for similar triangles. And that is why uh, we could do it by hand in a coffee shop. We don't even have to really sketch it with straight lines or really beautifully or anything. And then Heinrich gave us this extra gift by saying, well, what if delta is 1? Ah, we divide by 1, and then we got lots of answers really, really quickly. Really quickly. All right, let's move on um, to some numbers. Uh, if delta was 5 and you really made it big at the coffee shop, uh, loft one would be 3.62. Please stop the video if you don't understand similar triangles at all. Recreate these numbers. If delta is five and the span or the entire run was 18, what would be the loft at the 13 um, base of that similar triangle? That loft would be 3.62. And similarly, if delta was five, uh, loft 2 would be smaller. You could see that it's smaller. It would be 1.67. So please recreate that if that's a mystery to you. It shouldn't be a mystery. It shouldn't be hard. You should have seen this before. Somewhere. I don't know. Somewhere. <clears throat> then there's only one equation in the book. The similar triangles doesn't count. That's not algebra. The only equation in the book is unknown times delta plus each force multiplied by each loft is equal to zero. So now we have the unknown, which is the left reaction vertically, multiplied by uh, five. And I think I wrote 0 0.5. There should be five. Yes, five. Um, uh, and then the forces times the lofts, okay? And I get, uh, that should be five here. Uh, our left is two, four, four, five. Um, that's the theoretical answer. You're not responsible for the theoretical answer unless you are an architectural engineer where you are um, hopefully able to check these things. Okay, so let's get that answer. You should stop the video if you're confused. If you're super crystal clear, just keep going. But please do stop the video that for a, a perturbation of five, um, that's the answer, okay? Now I'm going to ask you to do something that's a little fussy. Uh, I'm going to ask you to find the right vertical equilibrating reaction. I really want you to respect all the other boundary conditions. So what are those other boundary conditions? The first is that the right side is a pin and I'm only moving it vertically. I am not moving it horizontally. The second boundary condition is that that wheel or that roller cannot go up or down, but it is free to slide horizontally, okay? So now please do stop the video, sketch out the perturbed shape. What does this look like if the right side goes up but does not move horizontally? What does the perturbed shape look like? Doesn't matter how big delta is at all. Make it big enough so that you could see it. Please stop the video. Okay, we're back. I hope you. I hope you. Uh, I hope you did all that, and you found this picture here. So what I did was I went straight up. I went straight up, and now you could see that the stick slides that roller rolls here and this is a little fussy a little fussy um you don't have to do that you could actually just do this but i'm, I'm kind of trying to point out that the um in the modern mueller breslau method this is what we would do in the classic Mueller-Breslau, we would stretch it, 
Okay, so I'm planting the seeds for the modern Mueller Breslau that method. That's the name of the course. I really want you to start thinking about rigid links, but for the purposes of a hand sketch, the classic method would be it stretches. We use similar triangles. We can figure all this out. Okay, so uh, if that's confusing, uh, we'll we'll clarify it next time. I'll be explicitly clear when I want you to use the, the classic method uh, versus the um, um, modern method. So in the modern method, uh, we would have to actually measure these lofts, loft one and loft two. Um, and if delta is eight, you could see a lot of sliding here in the modern method. So this is the modern method, okay? And that's a hint of things to come. We're not going to do that now. We're going to do this. This is the classic method. Just pretend that it's going straight up and that the stick stretches. The stick stretches. Uh, you can get your lofts here uh, and um, solve the problem essentially pretty quickly. Uh, that um, in the modern, again, this is the modern method. This is the, and this is the classic method. So in the classic method, we have RR times eight minus the work of the 2000 minus the work of the 3000. Now, why is it minus? The forces are going down, the lofts are going up. They oppose each other. They oppose each other. Okay, and in the classic method, when the beam stretches, uh, we see uh, the exact answer from some from similar triangles. <clears throat> now let's go um, a little bit further and on page three, on page three of your textbook, um, we have this set of rules, right? And I hope you don't think these rules are arbitrary or capricious or anything like that. Um, I think they are there to help you. Uh, they're on page three of the book so that you can go back and say, uh oh, what do I do here? So number five is our new complexity. If there is a kink in the structure due to the perturbation, the load must be broken up to sub portions on either side of the link. Now that may seem super mysterious, but once you sketch it out, even in the classic method where everything is stretching and you're sketching this out on a piece of paper or on a napkin, you will see what, what, why this rule is, is there. It's very, very logical. So here's the first image that I'd like you to see. It's a cantilever beam. There is a distributed load of 100 force per length it starts at the six unit mark and it goes all the way up to the tip of the beam. And suppose I wanted to find the equilibrating moment here at this cut. And that cut happens to be at the three unit mark, just like last time, but there's nothing magic about three. That cut can move anywhere in the beam, but let's keep the cut away from the load. Let's keep the cut away from the load. So what are the steps? The steps are take the distributed load and make an equivalent concentrated load. Now, what does that mean? We talked about this before. If you're on the bottom of the pyramid in the cheerleaders pyramid, you feel something, right? You just feel this equivalent load of all of that mess above you, right? So here it's 100 force per length over a unit length of seven, over a length of seven. So how much do I have? Let's say there's, it's 100 um, units of force per width of, of human, right? <laughs> and there are seven such humans, right? How many do you have? You have 700 units of force, right? I hope it's intuitive, right? Um, where is it located? Well, it's located at the balance point. Just find the balance point. It's not here at the tip, right? It's, it's here. It's at the balance point. There's a fancy word for balance point. It is centroid. But you could just say at the midpoint of the distribution, right? 
if it's a uniformly distributed force, the balance point has to be halfway across the force. I hope that's intuitive. So we have 700 units of force at the halfway point. We crack the beam at the point of investigation at that cut. And we're using Heinrich's method of 45 because we're doing everything by hand. So that's 45 degrees. Now I didn't even draw it to scale. I just drew a delta and I know that the rise is equal to the run. So the loft at the 6.5 mark has to be 6.5. The rise is equal to the run. We saw that last time in the previous lesson. Go review that if that still is puzzling you. And delta is one. Now I hope your heads are hurting if you are a structural engineering student who knows how to do this algebraically because the moment is that force times the vertical loft because we're dividing by one. It's so sweet. It's so sweet. It's negative because the 700 is going down and the loft is going down. So that's positive energy. When we swing it over to the other side of the equation, it becomes negative. We divide by delta, thing of beauty. Now suppose the cut was somewhere in the distributed load. This is why you will see that the kink is super important. Here we have the same situation, 100 force per length, but now I wanna look at the cut at the nine unit mark from the wall. Six plus three is nine, so what's happening there? So I must break it up to two equivalent loads one on either side of the cut. Now, why do I do that? Because all of the load on the left side of the cut does no work at all. Nothing. There's no loft. It's only the load that is on the other side of the cut that does work. So we must break up the load in proportion to the distance of the distribution on either side of the cut. <clears throat> so for instance, if it was a three unit mark and then a four unit mark, you would have 300 units of force centered on the three unit mark that would be at 1.5 past where it starts. So that would be 7.5 from the wall, but I don't really need that location because it is not moving. You can see it's not moving. I do need the other location. So it's four units of length at 100 force per length. So it's 400 units of force. Where is it located? At the midpoint of the four. So I have a two and a two. Heinrich told us to use the 45 degree. So the rise is equal to the run. Therefore, the loft is two you guys are so good so good you're doing great so m at the cut times delta plus 400 times two they agree they're going in the same direction is equal to zero you bring the 400 and the two over to the other side you divide by one boom you've got your answer yeah that's nice <clears throat> okay in summary, the concentrated loads are quick. They sit on the beam in the classic method. They just go straight up because the element stretches. Each load has a loft. You use similar triangles. If there are distributed loads and no kink, it's pretty quick. You just get the equivalent force, find where it is. That's why it's equivalent. Equivalent. That's why I keep saying equivalent. In fact, I capitalized the word equivalent there. However, if there's load on either side of the kink, you must break up the load in proportion to how much is on one side of the kink and how much is on the other side. And the reason why we do that is obvious from the previous slide. If that didn't make sense, go look at that previous slide again. Uh, you have two etudes. 
uh, number 2-11 and 2-12. Draw everything by hand, take pictures of it, put it in a single document, not two documents, just one document, make it a PDF, upload it, full marks, you're doing great, so happy, so happy you're loving this. Um, have fun with this, send questions, which you must have. Bye.